Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. <clears throat> I think we were right on the button there. I was trying to time it just right so it was like naught, 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 naught um, when I actually got up here. Um, I'm not sure whether or not I managed it, but I think I was pretty much there. Um, sorry I wasn't here last week. I don't know whether anybody missed me. Um, probably not. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. um, I was actually um, in Manchester, um, not for the football. Um, which is a shame, because going up to Manchester and not going to the football, in my opinion, is probably a bit of a waste. Um, but I was actually going up to move Daisy back down um, from Manchester um, uh, back down here. So the whole Cobalt family now is in, in the region. Noah's now with me. Um, my dining room looks as though a bomb has hit it because he's got nowhere else to store his stuff. And he's probably a little bit like me in as much as, well, we will do it, but will probably start tomorrow, that sort of thing. So how long it's going to stay like that, I've got, I'm, I've got no, absolutely no, no idea. Um, so it's good, everybody's back. Um, now, I don't know whether or not anybody remembers UPIM. Yeah. Yeah. You remember UPIM? Well, I got a UPIM this week. I won't say who from, because I don't want to embarrass her. So that cuts down it by 50%, doesn't it? But I got a U-pin, and do you know what? I got it, and I read the text, and it really encouraged me. Don't know what it meant. She, uh, the, the lady who sent it to me didn't really know why she was sending it to me either. Maybe it'll be made clear to me um, in the future. I don't know. But it was such an encouragement to get a U-pin text. Now, how many of you have done that over COVID? Come on, be honest. Yeah, so a few people have done it. I'd really encourage you all to do that. Somebody pops into your mind, just send them a quick text and whatever, because it makes a real difference. It made a real difference to me. Um, back to more churchy things. Um, we've got something new in the church. Anybody know what they are? Yeah, so there's prayer corners. So if anybody wants prayer at the end of the service or whatever, then make your way over to there. And I'm sure the elders and some of the senior members of the congregation will, will pray with you. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we're going to start the service in a minute by singing, which 
we're all probably looking forward to it. I hope you had a good time um, last week, but um, this is my first time singing for 18 months, is it? I don't know, I can't remember. Psalm 89 verse 1 says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Isaiah 42 verse 10 says, Sings to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. Acts 16 verse 25, about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Colossians 3 verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Psalm 105 verse 2, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Now obviously I could go on. Did you know that the word sing is mentioned 121 times in the Bible, or 209 times if you read the New English Version? I've been Googling this. Um, the Bible contains over 400 references to sing. 50 of these are direct commands to sing. And did you know that God is passionate about singing? So why does God so often tell us not simply to praise him, but to sing his praises when we meet? Why not just pray and preach? Why sing? Why are God's people throughout history always singing? Why words and music and not just words alone? Why does God want us to sing? Well, one reason, and I didn't know this, um, is that God sings himself. In Zephaniah, Zephaniah, I had to look that up to make sure that was the right right book because I forgot. Um, Chapter 13, verse 17, it says, God exalts over his people with loud singing. Don't you think that's an encouragement? I think that's an encouragement. So let's stand and we'll get a hand over to Mike and we'll sing a couple of songs to get us going.
so. Amen. Now this bit of the service I've been really looking forward to all week. Um, we're going to have um, an interview uh, now with uh, young Emily who have to say you've got to be gentle with her. I've got to be gentle with her. Susan told me that I've got to be gentle with her um, and not mess about and put her at her ease um, and whatever because she's a bit nervous, all right? Um, she's a bit nervous. I'm a bit nervous, to be fair, but, you know, we'll go with the flow. So, anyway, so, Emily, would you like to come up? <laughs> <laughs> come up and take a seat. <laughs> Questions. Questions. <laughs> 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 yes. 
<laughs> so, Emily. Did you like the introduction? That's great. Yeah, That's a great, great introduction. <laughs> I'm not suggesting at all that you're anything like Barbara Windsor when you're at work. <laughs> um, but anyway. No comment. Um, <clears throat> But I sort of assume that that might be a true representation of your work. Is that is that? Well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably pleased to hear that, you know, from a professional point of view. Um, so, okay, we all know that you're a nurse. Shall I just move this? Yeah. yeah. We all know that you're a nurse, but what is your actual job title? So I'm a practice nurse manager now. Okay. Yeah. And so, what does that? involved what what is it what, tell us a little bit about your role so um, I work in a GP surgery in Newmarket and I have a team of eight nurses who I manage and I sort of I'm the go-between between the doctors and the partners running the business and the nurses doing the job that they require and everything in between really <laughs> oh, right okay so <laughs> it's quite a busy role mm -hmm. and what about off duty is that a bit of a nightmare um yes I think off that's duty, the same in any for those role. who don't know <laughs> That's like your roster and whatever, and you can never please anybody, no, can never. you? You can never please everybody. So, okay, what is a typical day like for you? So, for instance, what will you be doing tomorrow morning? I'm actually on leave this week. Oh. So, yeah, so, <laughs> but next Monday. <laughs> you never told me that, Susan. <laughs> so, on a normal Monday, um, our day is, is, is split into 10 minute appointments the whole day, apart from lunchtime, which is usually a meeting. So. As you hit the ground running, your day is generally planned from half past eight in the morning. There's lots of gaps, there's lots of emergency bits that come in. Um, it can be from your wound care, childhood immunisations, public health matters to long-term conditions that we're managing. And anybody walks through the doors, because we're right in town, you find somebody who's from London visiting for the day who happens to have fallen over and uh, create an injury that we yeah. will try and fix too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> So quite yeah, involved. Quite though. variable. Yeah. Do you in, so this is I'm improvising now. Don't <laughs> tell anybody. But um, is that what is that the variety? Is that is that what you enjoy? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, I like that. There's a lot of planned work. There's a lot of long-term care that you do. So you really get to know some patients really thoroughly. But I do okay. quite like not knowing what's going to happen day to day. That's quite fun. And do you like all of your patients? Honestly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <coughs> um, so uh, I've asked you what do you really enjoy about your job, the variety and all that sort of thing. So conversely, is there anything that you don't like about your job? Problems, frustrations? Yeah, I think the frustration is more is challenging expectations. You know, there's the high expectation of the NHS and then sometimes there's reality of what you can actually offer. Um, so I feel like we're apologising a lot for what we don't do. Right. But actually, I think you know, we all do our best. Sometimes yeah. it's quite hard to you feel like you're defending yourself a lot, but I think that's the same in any area of care, really. Do you think most people are, are, are quite okay with that? or? Yes. But yeah, the vast majority are very accepting. Okay. But like in any, anywhere, in any job, you always get challenges where... Challenges, that's yeah. a good word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crashing a little bit, yeah. <laughs> So, um, move it, you mentioned challenges, so what are the challenges that you face regularly then on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, access to us, people find quite difficult. Um, I think that's, a, you know, again, that's not specific to us trying to get hold of a GP these days is not easy. But seeing it from the inside, it's because they're trying to plan their time to not waste time. Okay. They're trying to make their time as useful as possible, which does mean delegating jobs to other members of the team and members of the workforce. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with them people being a bit frustrated because they feel they want to speak to a doctor, but actually it might be something someone else can resolve. Okay. So those sort of things are hard. Okay. So um, how can we pray for you, or what would you like perhaps a specific um, prayer for? Well, we have got to try and manage the COVID booster vaccines towards the end of the summer, beginning October-ish time, and we've got very little information and like the last lot of COVID vaccinations, we had a very short space of time to work yeah, out how yeah, to manage it. Um, which was, so now we know we've done it, we can do it again. But that, that was a huge amount of work. Um, so I would really appreciate any support from, okay. from, the, from the logistical side of things, let alone keeping people well. That's, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. It wasn't that bad, was it? It was all right, yes. No, and I was gentle, wasn't you I? Were very yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was gentle. Okay, Thank that's, that's fine. Emily Griffiths, 
our very own Barbara Windsor. <laughs> 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 Um, now, it's time in the service. We're going to pray for Emily um, and the NHS as a whole. Um, now, I'm going to give you some prayer points and whatever, and we'll leave it open for prayer. Please don't be shy, because otherwise it'll be re there'll be a real gap on the online <coughs> bit and whatever. So, you know, let's pray for Emily and the NHS as a whole. Um, so just a few facts, a um, few points. Did you know that the NHS was the third largest employer in the world? Did you know that? After the Chinese Army and the Indian Railways, courtesy of Susan. I didn't, I didn't Google that. Um, so specific prayer points. Um, pray for someone you know um, who is not well and pray for their healing. Pray for good medical attention. Pray for the NHS. Pray that this enormous organisation um, to, to, to function in the best way possible and pray for all the staff, doctors, nurses, um, technicians, and all the staff who worked um, in, within the NHS and whatever role they have, whether it's in hospitals, GP practices, or whatever. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you are such a loving and faithful and mighty God. And Lord, we just lift up all those who work in the NHS before you today. And we give thanks for that amazing organization, Lord, that uh, we have been blessed with in this country. And we just give so, so many thanks for all the people that work within it, um, all the people that lead it, and every single person that works within it, the last ambulance driver, the last cleaning lady, cleaning gentleman, porters, everybody that works together as a team, Lord, um, to do your work. We thank you for each and every one of them. We thank you for all their good work throughout all of these last 18 months of the pandemic and all their amazing energy that they've shown and the way they've kept going, Lord. And we thank you particularly for those who are your people, those who are Christians within the NHS, Lord. And we ask that you will bless them and continue to, um, well, lead and guide them as they try to speak into their workplaces and speak to people around them and comfort them and help to treat them, Lord. We just ask that you will continue to lead and guide them give them the words to say, and as they, um, through their actions, Lord, live out um, your word, let others around them who are non-Christians see that, Lord, and may that um, move their hearts and their minds by your Holy Spirit, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you'll soften hearts and minds of those non-Christians, both patients and, and people who work within the NHS. And we pray for resources, Lord, we know that there's a shortage of resources and there has been a great shortage of resources during the pandemic time and people are on waiting lists or have been on waiting lists. Thank you now that the waiting lists are starting to clear um, and we ask that you will make a way forward for those who have been waiting for operations and procedures to happen, that they will, um, the logistics of that happening will now move forward, Lord. And we pray, as Emily's just asked, for the logistics of um, the rolling out of the vaccine, that you will continue to um, give wisdom, grant wisdom, and um, make a way forward for those within the NHS to be able to roll out that vaccine smoothly, that people will come forward, the younger generation, perhaps who've been a little bit more reluctant, um, or anxious about accepting a vaccine, we just ask that you will encourage them to come forward. And Lord, we just thank you for them all. Please, we ask that you will bless their work and grant them strength and energy and wisdom and sustain them all, all those who work in the NHS. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Lloyd, I thank you for all the MLEs that we have in the National Hall, whether they're male or female. I do thank you for them. I, I thank you for their dedication, for the love and the care that they do give. But Lloyd, we know that sometimes being caring can also be frustrating. Give them a lot of peace in what they do. Help them to feel appreciated. Help patients to feel appreciated. And thank them for, for the work that they do. When we think about Emily, mm -hmm. we do thank you for Emily in a, a lovely way and lovely disposition. To strengthen her, encourage her, help her to do the job that clearly she'd been called to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, as we uh, thank you for, for Emily, we thank you for the vocation that you've placed within her. And we thank you for uh, the dedication uh, that she has for her role. Um, Father God, I pray that you will support Nick and Freya um, and help, uh, to help Emily um, with, with that role. Amen. So I've been working in Newmarket um, for the last uh, couple of weeks um, for a chap that I actually work with at, at Tesco's um, and building um, a garden room, sort of stroke office uh, for his daughter, um, a shed and a chicken coop um, and whatever. Last week it was really hot. We were cementing and digging and whatever, which is not, not pleasant. And this week we were wet in another way because the, the rain was coming off the roof and dripping down, um, uh, down my neck. Um, Ray Kelly um, has been coming um, uh, as well and helping me. Um, and as usual, uh, we've been listening to Ant's Worship Mix. Um, and we've had a couple of conversations this last week um, about blessing, um, you know, as you do. Um, I think it's easy sometimes to think uh, that when things go well for us or we are conscious of something happening in our life that we have specifically prayed for or we see evidence in other people that things are good. Um, so what is the real meaning of blessing? A blessing is a prayer asking for God's protection or a little gift from the heavens. Blessings have to do with approval, protection and favour. Another word for blessing is grace. And uh, we like that word, don't we? You know. Um, so, anyway, I told you earlier that Daisy and Noah um, have moved back this way. Daisy back from Manchester, Noah from Lincoln. Um, and they went to Southwold on Monday uh, this week. Um, so nothing strange about that. They wanted picking up from the train station in Cambridge um, but as you know I play football on a Monday night um, and it was going to clash um, so I agreed to pick them up even though the train was getting in at, at 20 to 10 um, I agreed that I would pick them up at 10 um, and leave football um, a little bit early so picture the scene right it's dark um, I just left the Astro um, at the sports centre at 9.30 bit sweaty right you know, because obviously I run around loads, um, you know, <laughs> at my age. Um, and in full Manchester United kit, of course, okay? So, because it was quite warm, so I was just, like, just in my kit. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just drive to the station, pick them up, come home, have a shower, go to bed, you know, that sort of thing. Out of Burwell, I started to, to think if, uh, if things with the car were, were, were actually okay. It was, a, it was a bit sort of wobbling a bit and I was, you know I could hear this sort of bump, 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 bump. and uh, yeah I thought it was just me and I thought well I'll just carry on you know regardless you know that sort of a bit further along and it started not to sort of handle quite right I could feel it sort of like swaying a bit um, 
kept going because um, I obviously needed to pick them up, didn't want to be late. Um, and then through Bullbeck and just on the long, the straight road there up towards Lode and Anglesey, um, there was definitely something wrong. Um, and then it was bang, bang, bang um, and whatever. Um, so anyway, on go the Park Anywhere lights and I limped to the lay-by just um, inside the, the load turning. Um, there's a little lay-by there, and quite handily there's a street light there. So, so there I am, right, in full Manchester United kit, right, with my back tyre completely disintegrated. Um, the tread had actually come completely away from the wall. Um, and so, and then I was having to think, well, I'm gonna have to change the tyre now, obviously, so I have to wrestle with all of the stuff that I've got in the car, all my tools, and because my van's not working. Um, and there was so, so much stuff in the boot in, in order to get to the spare wheel. Anyway, I changed the tyre um, in about 20 minutes. I'm not sure Lewis Hamilton would be too keen on that, but I thought it was quite good, to be fair. Um, and I picked the kids up, and it was, everything was all right um, in the end. So I started off this section talking about blessing. And you're now thinking, well, why am I telling you this story? Because that doesn't sound like a great experience at all. Um, so I said earlier that blessings, we all tend to think about blessings when things go right or things happen for us that we want. Um, but do we see blessings when things don't go quite according to plan? So how can I personally see blessings in a flat tyre? Or how can I, having a flat tyre, be a blessing to me? Well, thinking about it, there are actually a number of blessings in that situation for me personally. I realised that I was so blessed that Noah wasn't driving. I would rather me be driving and have a flat tyre, so I was blessed because Noah wasn't driving. Obviously, being his dad didn't want to hurt himself, that sort of thing. Do you get where I'm sort of coming from? I was so blessed that it didn't on, happen on the way back with both Daisy and Noah in the car, because it might have been, you know, it might have been worse. And so blessed that it only cost me 60 odd quid to get it fixed, which was a real bonus. So what I'm trying to say is that we should really look for the blessing even when the situation is not a good one. So, so many things happen and we always tend to think about things negatively, don't we, when things don't go quite according to plan. But I would encourage you all, you know, maybe in the next week, when something doesn't go quite right, think about that blessing and whatever that might be hidden in your negativity. Anyway, we're going to sing again now um, a song that I think is appropriate for that last little bit. Shall we stand? Let's stand. Sorry, Mark.
reading is taken from Luke chapter 9 and verse, verses 10 to 17. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowds away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we, we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. There were about 5,000 men who were there. <coughs> but he said to his disciples, Having, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each, the disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. So Susan now is going to come up and uh, um, give us this morning's message. But before she does that, let's pray for her. Father God, I thank you for Susan. Thank you for what she does for the church. Thank you for what she means to us all here as a church. Lord, I pray that you will bless her as she stands up here and, and gives us uh, your word for today. And I hope that what, by what she says, um, it, it will bless it to us. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here. And I'm going to say good morning by faith to those who are joining um, live on YouTube, right? Hopefully. So, um, last week, those of you who were here will remember that Chris preached on the theme of going back or moving on. And if you haven't heard that yet, then I would do, uh, do encourage you to go back and listen to that. Um, but if you remember, the Israelites had arrived at the Jordan. Uh, spies had been sent into the land to suss it out. And the majority of the spies had come back with negative reports. They said, the land devours anyone living in it. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. And so they were discouraged, and they were afraid, and they wanted to go back to Egypt, back rather than forward to the new thing. And so Chris then encouraged us to move forward as a church into new territory, a way we've never walked before, because we can't go back. No matter how much we might want to, history moves in one direction. And then uh, a couple of Sundays ago, we had our commitment service, and we recommitted ourselves to God and his covenant to us. And Chris encouraged us to think about our offering as our whole lives, Monday to Saturday, as well as Sunday, that we offer our bodies and all that we are as a living sacrifice to God. This is our true and proper worship. So this week, in the light of what Chris said, I'd like us to revisit an old question that we asked ourselves pre-pandemic. And I want to do this for two reasons. One, because we aren't the same. Like it or not, the pandemic has changed us. And so our response might not be the same. And two, because as we move into the new, the question is really important. There might be some slides there, um, James. Let's put the first one up. Probably sit here on them. 
So you might remember that it was Nick Cuthbert who posed five questions to us as a sort of personal checkup or MOT. And I'm just going to run through the five really briefly so that you get a quick overview. So the first one, if you remember, was a question that God asked Adam in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. Uh, next, next, next one, I think. Um, and that question was, um, where are you? If you go to the next one, Jane. Hopefully it'll come up. Okay, maybe it won't. If it doesn't, it's fine. It's just, just to be a little click away. Okay, I'm going to carry on. So that question was, where are you? And that question is about relationship. Um, and it's about how is your relationship with God? Are you spending time with him? Are you reading his word? Are you listening to him? Where are you? The second question, and the one we're going to be focusing on today, God asks Moses in Exodus chapter 4. Can you remember what that was? It was what's in your hand? What is that in your hand? Moses was feeling really inadequate, and he had in his hand his staff. That was his living. And God asked him to throw it down. What's in your hand? The third question God asked Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, and that question was, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And there were two implications to that question. There was the physical implication, what are you doing here? Are you in the right place now? And then there was the emotional implication. Elijah was depressed, and God was saying, why are you in this attitude of mind? The fourth question uh, God asked Jeremiah in chapter 1, and that is, what do you see, Jeremiah? And that was all about vision. And the final question he asked Ezekiel, and that question was, can these dry bones live? Um, and he answered, Sovereign Lord, only you know. And that question is about the areas of despair in our lives, the areas of dry bones. Do you believe that that's the end of the story, or do you think that God is going to do something about those? So, let's look in more detail at the second question, what's in your hand, in the light of this very familiar passage from Luke. So, we know from other passages in the Gospels that the feeding of the 5,000 took place just after the disciples had been out on mission, and also just after Jesus had been told that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And we also know from Mark's Gospel that having come back from mission, as the disciples are having a kind of a debrief with Jesus, people are coming and going, presumably because they want to be healed. Um, and so Mark says they didn't even have time to get something to eat. So in the light of this context, Jesus says, look, let's get away from here. Let's find somewhere quiet to get something to eat and rest. So they go off to Bethsaida, which is where Philip, Andrew and Peter are from. And they go there to find a quiet place. And presumably they knew all the quiet places in Bethsaida because three of them were from there. But that plan doesn't come to fruition because the crowds, all these needy people found out that they were going to Bethsaida, and they followed them. So it's late in the afternoon, having presumably eaten nothing for hours, exhausted, that the, disciple come, the disciples come to Jesus with a very reasonable request. Can you send the crowds away now, please? Because they're going to need something to eat, and they're going to need to find somewhere to sleep. And they probably expected Jesus to say something like, oh, yes, sorry, lost track of time there, I did. Didn't realise it was late in the afternoon. And yes, of course, these people need to eat. Off you go, everyone. That's what they probably were expecting Jesus to say. But instead, he says six words that they were not expecting to hear that they probably weren't in the mood to hear, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. I think we might be a few bits.
So this context is important. When Jesus says, you give them something to eat, it's not like they're having a mountaintop moment here. They haven't just come back from two weeks' holiday. They've been out on mission. They want to tell Jesus all about it. They are exhausted. They keep getting interrupted. And they've had some pretty awful news about John. Their expectations have been raised. Yay! We're going to get some alone time with Jesus. We're going to have some food and fellowship. And dashed. Oh, so the crowds have got wind of it and bang goes that lovely plan. Do you see what I'm saying here? It's easy to put a sort of two-dimensional religious filter on the narrative where all humanness is lost, like the disciples went around in this kind of semi-trance, holy state, and nothing fazed them. Our question, what have you got in your hand, is implicit here. You give them something to eat. I love their reply. They don't exactly say, are you mad? But you can almost read the irritation in their hangry response. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. And just to clarify, Luke adds in brackets, in a very diplomatic way, about 5,000 men were there. We have only. Only is such an important and revealing word. In the middle of the lived tension and struggle, they don't say, well, Lord, we have five loaves and two fish, but we know that you are a miracle-working God because we've just come off mission and seen evidence of that. So here, take our meagre offering, and in faith, we will watch how you multiply it and feed these lovely people. We have only. We have not enough. We have not enough to get this task done, Lord, And you know the Lord doesn't rebuke them here. Here there is no, oh, you of little faith. He knows they haven't got enough. He knew it when he asked them to feed the crowd. I wonder if the disciples knew it. I don't know, maybe having been out healing the sick and driving out demons... Maybe they just needed a reminder that after all it was Jesus who gives power and authority. As he says at the beginning of uh, Luke chapter 9. Maybe they needed to hear themselves speak out the words, we have only. Maybe. Jesus knew they were exhausted. He knew that they longed for some time with him on their own. He knew that they needed rest. He could have said, don't worry, I will do a miracle and I will feed all of these people and I'll feed you too without involving the disciples, without including their not enough, without irritating them by his unreasonable reply, you give them something to eat. So why didn't he? And why wasn't he more sensitive to their physical and emotional state? Well, God chooses to do things in partnership with humans. It seems to be his joy and delight to do so. He uses their not enough. He uses their ability to organise the crowd into groups of about 50 I wonder how long that took, and I wonder what was going through their minds as they did it. He gets them to participate in the miracle by sharing out the loaves and fish. In fact, they fully participated before the miracle, having the crowd sit down in groups, 
during the miracle, distributing the food, and after the miracle, collecting the leftovers into baskets. So they saw and lived and experienced in the very depths of their being how Jesus took their not enough and made it more than enough with 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over. And how important would that be after Jesus was crucified and after he rose again and after he told them to go and make disciples of all nations? A little bit later in this chapter, Jesus goes on to say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. To follow in Jesus' footsteps means sacrifice, a denying of oneself, a following Jesus, not pulling against what he's doing, send the crowd away, Lord, but unfurling one's sails to catch the wind of the Spirit. You give them something to eat. And a couple of chapters later, Jesus would teach his disciples the Lord's Prayer, the daily prayer of the Christian, give us this day our daily bread, teaching an utter dependence on God for our needs in every situation. Shortly after this narrative, literally in the passage that comes straight after, Jesus asks the disciples, A, who the crowd say he is, and B, who do you say I am? And the disciples say, well, the crowd, some of them think that you're John the Baptist and some of them think that you're Elijah. But what about you, says Jesus? Who do you say I am? And Peter declares that Jesus is God's Messiah. Uh, we might be a few on now. So, how might we apply all of this to our lives in 2021, and in particular in our context here today at this time and in this place. Well, firstly, and kind of unfortunately really, well, that's what I think, it's clear that God doesn't wait for us to be all strong and ready before he asks us, what have you got in your hand? Moses, when he asked him that question, felt utterly inadequate. The disciples didn't answer Jesus from a place of sufficiency. They didn't say, well, Lord, we have loaves and fish and the gift of faith that you've given us. They felt discomfort. And I really want to get this across. They were way out of their comfort zones. I think they'd probably been way out of their comfort zones from the moment they spotted the crowds waiting for them. And it's easy to kind of say, oh, they were way out of their comfort zones. But when you're feeling it, you know, we're going to feel this. We're going to feel way out of our comfort zones. And that's not nice. It's not a pleasant feeling. Jesus will test you and take you to the very edges of the outside of your comfort zone when he asks you the question, what have you got in your hand? What have you got in your hand having just poured yourself out for the benefit of others on mission? What have you got in your hand when you're hungry and grumpy and exhausted? What have you got in your hand after you receive devastating news? What have you got in your hand after 18 months of global pandemic? What have you got in your hand when you're battling with long-term sickness and depression? What have you got in your hand? And the answer will always be not enough. And it is there in the place of insufficiency that the miracle happens. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord to take it away from him three times. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When the rubber hits the road and we have nothing to give, when we are empty and worn out and fed up, when we are on unfamiliar territory and we feel we have no clue what we're doing and when we feel God nudging us 
and prompting us to do something that we feel utterly inadequate for. We take our we have only, I have only, we take our not enough to him. We do the equivalent of arranging the crowd into groups of 50, of distributing our transformed not enough into more than enough. And then like Peter, we will proclaim and declare with fresh insight and revelation that Jesus is God's Messiah. So how might we respond? Well, on an individual level, what do you have in your hands today that doesn't feel like much at all, that feels not enough? Maybe you already know. Maybe it's a relationship with someone that you think, well, it's just a friendship. But it's strong enough to offer to pray with them for healing. Maybe it's a job that puts you alongside people in need of hope and compassion and you're just thinking, well, it's just a job. Maybe it's a gift that feels stale and old. Maybe you're not enough is you because you feel tired and weary, too ill, too old, too not enough. Perfect. Perfect. Whatever it is that you have in your hand, say out loud to God, I have only... And I feel way, way out of my comfort zone. But take it, Lord. Take my not enough. Break it open so that I might be a blessing to others. May your kingdom come in my life. So that's on an individual level. What about this church? Well, we've been encouraged to move forward into new territory on an unfamiliar path. We've reflected in recent weeks on some of the new things that we are discerning that God is calling us into. Cooking together at home, worship in the woods, more of an online presence. So where is our corporate not enough? Where is our we have only? Well, here are some examples. We have only a limited number of people. We have only a small number of families. We have only a small number of children. We have only a certain number of hours in the day. We have only fill in the blanks. I'm sure if I went around, you'd all come up with a we have only. Because we're a small rural church. But in the light of this passage in Luke, this is good news. It's brilliant news, in fact. Because we can say it out loud to God, we have only. And he won't rebuke us for admitting our not enough to him. Isn't that wonderful? This is good news. All we have to do is listen to his instructions and obey what he says before, during, and after whatever it is he is about to do here. We have only. But God's word over that is, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. I'm going to pray in the first person to start with so that you can make this prayer your own. Lord God, I confess that I like to do things from a place of strength and I do not like feeling outside of my comfort zone. Would you reveal and pinpoint if you haven't already, where it is that I need to give you my insufficiency, my not enough, 
and where I need to trust you and your strength and your grace as I step out in faith and serve you in the place where you've placed me, Lord. And Lord, as church, you know and you see our collective we have only, our collective not enough. But we declare with Paul that your power is made perfect in weakness. Help us, Lord, as we move forward to look not at our insufficiency, but at your all-sufficiency. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Susan. Right, we're going to finish off our time uh, together this morning with um, a time of worship. Um, and sitting there listening to the, the message this morning, um, I thought I'd issue a little bit of a challenge, as in, I want you all to think really, really carefully as we're worshipping um, about how you worship this morning. I'm certainly going to try and do that um, myself. Um, we all know of churches with big worship bands at the, at the front of the church. Um, we all know of churches that have got 500 people who go on a Sunday morning. Um, blah, blah, blah. You know, I could go on. But we have this group, this church, and we have musicians. We have words and we have songs that we can worship our God with. Okay, so let's stand and as we worship. And if there's a gap, please feel free to do, to pray, uh, whatever. Bring something to us, share something. But let's stand and worship. <clears throat> One or two of these songs may be a little unfamiliar, um, as I've now realised. Um, but I'll try to lead as best I can. Um, if you can't manage the words, then just worship quietly and we'll see how we go. Let's just pray as we start. Father God, measured against your immense power and glory <clears throat> we feel sometimes weak and helpless inadequate for the task you have placed upon us but Lord what what we have in our hand you can use for your glory. You strengthen us by your spirit. You strengthen us by your love. And you call us to glorify you with our lives as they are where they are mm -hmm. and with those who surround us. And so, Lord, we worship you now, knowing that whatever we have, you can use.
into your hands I commit again who I am for you you hold my world in the palm of your hand and I move Thank you.
that song. Keep playing, Mike. Um, I feel as if um, God is saying to me, um, be bold. Um, thinking about what Susan has said to us, um, about taking what it is that we have. Are you standing there giving your all? Are you worshipping as you should? Am I worshipping as I should? Let's be bold as we continue. I will. one or two would like to continue our worship in prayer holy and loving God we just want to praise you and praise your mighty and holy name and we want to thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit lives within each of us. And remind us, Lord, remind us, each and every one of us, that in our own strength we are weak. But in your strength, Lord, in your spirit, we can do all things. And help us, Lord, never to give up and always to rely on you. Because it's only through you and your Holy Spirit we can do anything. So help us, Lord, and we thank you. 
in Jesus' name. this week my not enoughs will be more than enough Amen.
grace is complete, I will So, Lord, I take, I pray that you will take what we have. We know it may be not much, but we pray that you will multiply it and use it for your glory in this place, in this community. In Jesus' name, amen.